Stating unfulfilled promises, the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU, begins a two-week warning strike. And Defend Yourselves says the movement for the actualization of the sovereign state of Biafra must sub to the people of the South-South and the Southeast regions of Nigeria. This is PLOS Politics and I am Felicity Ezewike. You're welcome. The Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU, has begun a two-week warning strike, citing the federal government's inability to pay salaries of lecturers who are not enrolled into the Integrated Personnel and Payroll Information System, IPPIS, as the major reason. The group explained that the warning strike was also to compel the federal government to implement the outstanding agreement of resolutions of the Memorandum of Action had with the union in 2009, 2013, 2017 and 2019. Joining me in the studio to discuss this is public affairs analyst Lulu Elegbe. Thank Good you evening. for joining us. Good evening. Let's start with, before I come to you, I think we should take a look at the conversation we had earlier with the president of ASU, uh, that's the Unilag chapter, University of Lagos chapter, Dele Ashiru. And well, after that, I'll come to my guest in the studio. 2013, we have had a series of memorandum of understanding. We moved away from memorandum of understanding to memorandum of action. Between 2013 and 2020, government is still yet to fulfill the terms of the memorandum of action is freely signed with our union. Uh, indeed, the only ongoing issue is the issue of uh, renegotiation. And that is also not even being faithfully, uh, the timeline for it is not being faithfully followed. Coupled with this, uh, the news uh, media has been awashed by all manner of threats from the Minister of Finance about uh, deliberate refusal to pay legitimate salaries to our members. So these agitated our members and at the last National Executive Council meeting of our union, which ended yesterday, the union decided that, well, it is imperative to sound a note of warning to government by going on a two-week warning strike to give government opportunity to put his house together and resolve all the outstanding issues in the memorandum of, uh, of action. Should government then feel our union will meet in two weeks to review the next line of action? Uh, the reasons why we are opposed to IPPIS in the public domain, but for the avoidance of doubt, our union has made it abundantly clear that what is called IPPIS in Nigeria is to erode university autonomy because it violates the laws establishing federal universities in Nigeria. Not only that, universities have peculiarities because they are uh, uh, universal citizens of learning, and those peculiarities have not been captured under the IPPIS platform. You will also recall that on this matter, our union met the president, and we thought that with meeting the president, all parties would uh, revert to status quo ante until all of these gray areas are resolved. But we can see the upfront of, I mean, the minister of finance, especially on the office of the president, because she has not shown any due respect to that office, and that's why she's been issuing threats to our members which is now culminating in the failure of government to pay the February salaries of our members. So on the whole, we are opposed to IPPIS because it, it, it violates university autonomy. It has not taken care of the peculiarities of academic staff in Nigerian University. And as it has been revealed very recently, what is called IPPIS in Nigeria is fraud raised to power two. The avoidance of doubt, let me tell you the issues, the outstanding issues, one, go government have promised to inject 1.1 um, trillion into the education sector to revitalize the infrastructures in the university. Between 2013 and now, 
no dime has been released beyond the 200 billion released by the uh, good luck Jonathan administration. Not only that, uh, the end academic allowances of our members are yet to be paid in accordance with the memorandum of uh, action that we signed in 2019. Also, uh, the Federal Ministry of Education gave some specific guidelines for the renegotiation of the 2009 agreement. As we speak, only one item in our document is still being discussed by the renegotiation, renegotiating committee. And then government promised that it was going to send visitation panels to Nigerian universities in order to arrest the decay and the tyrannical and dictatorial tendencies of university administrators. Since 2019 till date, none of the visitation panels have been constituted, let alone to visit the university. So these issues are legion, and it is the totality of it that is culminating in this strike. But our expectation, the expectation of our union, is that we should not avoid an unnecessary crisis in the education sector. We are hoping that government will immediately call the leadership of our union to the negotiating table and discuss modalities for resolving all of these outstanding. All right, uh, that was a pretty long listen, but we needed to set a premise uh, for this conversation aside the statement that is in circulation in the media. Thank you again uh, for staying with us. Sure. You heard him. He talked about the fact that the system, the payroll system that the government is insisting is not only flawed, but is riddled with corruption. What's your take on that? Um, I'm not sure what he's basing that on, um, but it's, I sort of understand Asu's argument, to be honest, um, not because of corruption with IPIS, but my, the issue is IPIS is supposed to be, or it was built as a civil service um, tool to, in, in, in terms of um, payments going in, so almost like a single, um, a single source, single um, payment platform for those in the civil service. So it, their argument has always been that universities are not in the civil service. So universities shouldn't be made to, or university salaries shouldn't be paid through that system because they are not part of the civil service, which is an argument, in my opinion, that makes sense. Um, when they say that, uh, that IPIS has, um, has, is riddled with corruption, I haven't seen um, any examples of that. I haven't, I've looked for them, I haven't found any. So I'm not sure where that's coming from a ways basing it. But I do understand the argument about um, why they're reluctant to do it, even though I think about 55% of ASU members have already registered, 45% um, haven't. Um, so which means um, majority of, excuse me, of ASU members are already part of the system. Um, I think because the government had come up with this, I will call it a threat, with this policy that if you don't, get paid through IPIS, you don't get paid don't at get all. get paid, yes. Some of them so, are being owed. Exactly. So, um, it's, unfortunately, it's not, <laughs> this is not something that's going to go away anytime soon because um, ASU have actually come out with their own software saying that this, um, this solves the problems that IPIS um, doesn't solve. And they, I think they had that conversation sometime last year with the government, and they said the government never said any, never but came back to them. considering the peculiarities, <laughs> as you rightly identified, that um, uh, the universities shouldn't be a part of the civil service as mm. it is at the mm. moment, isn't that position they're taking something worth considering? Because they seem to believe strongly in it, and that is why they're embarking on this strike. Yeah, so that's why I said I understand their argument when they say that the universities should be exempt. And the, the other part of that argument is when you have, so with universities in Nigeria or anywhere in the world really, you have sometimes you have visiting lecturers from outside the country. And how do you then, how does the university then pay those, um, those lecturers through the same system? Because the system, um, from what I understand about it, um, it has... Um, or rather it recognizes pensionable income, those sorts of things. How do you do that with foreign, with foreign scholars, for example, or foreign lecturers? So they're, those, so they're right in identifying the reasons why they think universities should be exempt from the system. And again, they've come up with what they say is a solution. I haven't gone into what that looks like in detail, but at least they're proposing something that, okay, we're not saying we don't want to get paid through this um, this single system because yes, it does 
it does allow for transparency, but we're saying that we don't want this particular one because it has X, Y, Z problems. Here's another solution that we think will work. And that's how things get done. That's how things move forward. You sit down, you negotiate, you say, okay, this isn't going to work for us. We think this will work for us. The government should be looking at it as, okay, let's have a look at what you have. Let's see if this can bridge those gaps. But that doesn't seem to be what's happening here. Okay, some would say if it is not one thing, it is the other. This is not the yep. only reason they're having issues oh, no, with the, the government. Absolutely. And it decided 2009, yep. 2013, 2017, from memorandum of uh, understanding to memoranda yep. of action. Even, even further that back than that. None, none of these mm. seem to be implemented. What really um, um, should we be doing I mean, as a people, in reacting to government's continued um, behavior when it comes to the issue of ASU and its funding? So I think it's a priority question. I don't think, I think successive governments, it's not just this particular administration, even the last one and the one before, they, I don't think they see this as enough of a priority because if they did, we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, they have these conversations. It, it, it almost seems like whatever agreement they have is just an agreement to end the strike. Yeah, so that's so some people nothing, are actually, nothing happens you, you, after you, that. You, you, you are saying that they're playing politics with this, but should that be the case? No, because they, they keep coming and saying that we want to prioritize education, want to make sure, I mean, they come with all these huge promises, <laughs> yeah. and then at the end of the day, we're back to status quo. Yeah, What's but, the but way that's out? Yeah, but that's the, so the way out is for them to actually prioritize education. The reality is no government that we've had in, in as long as I can remember has put education at the right, in the right priority that it should have. Because when you have agreements with ASU, some of them 10 years old, that's a decade old, and you haven't implemented any of them. And then you have this conversation, this recurring conversations over a period of 10, 11, 12 years. And then ASU keeps coming back to say, we agreed on this, you haven't done this. We agreed on that, you haven't done that. And bear in mind that those, um, so when those things happen, there are going to be other issues that they raise along the line as well. So the list of issues keeps growing. And it keeps growing because they don't deal with any of the ones that have, that have gone before. So you have this laundry list of issues that each government somehow manages to keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. So we keep coming back here. So considering this long history, how optimistic mm. are you that this two weeks um, warning strike will really amount to something? I don't think it will, um, unfortunately. We were, funny enough, on this show, on this show sometime last year, they, they had, I think they had a strike sometime last year, and I, I think yeah, I mentioned. That, that was... Um, um, 20, the last strike they had was in 2018. Yeah, okay, so it was two, yeah. year, two years no, ago. It was so, two years ago. Yeah. So I had, I remember having that, um, I remember having this, this same conversation about this, the strike and what it means for the, and what it means for the country and whether or not it will, anything would change. And I remember saying at the time that, look, my worry about this, and it's not to be pessimistic, but my worry about this is if you look at the history, the government just seems to say, okay, fine. We've, it's almost like they want to be able to say we've reached an agreement um, without necessarily having any intention of carrying out anything, anything that has been agreed. And it was last year because I remember it was just before. The last before, was November 20th. So maybe it was a one, maybe it was they were having conversations wow. about going on strike at the mm -hmm. time because I remember it was close to the elections. Okay. And um, they, so I think, I'm not sure if it was you or your colleague that was asking at the time that are they doing this intentionally because it's close to the election? And I said, I, I said at the time that I can understand them doing I think that I because that conversation. that's when I the government the is studio, listening. Yes. Exactly. That's when the government is actually listening because obviously there's elections at stake, but right now there are no elections at stake. So it's, uh, and I think that's the unfortunate part because it shouldn't take something like elections being at stake to implement things that have actually been agreed on. So ASU keeps going on these strikes, and at the end of the day, who loses out? It's the students. That, that that's, was what, that's, that's where that's I was the, going that's to the unfortunate go next. Part you know, this strike, um, yep. is there any consideration by either the government or ASU in this mm. case um, as to the welfare of the people? We keep talking about the falling standard of education. Cumulatively, mm. uh, let me see if I have that figure. Um, since um, the past 19 years that we've been having uh, these, uh, you know, <coughs> incessant strike, 
we've had 40 months, 40 months, that's yeah. almost, um, if that's three and that's and almost years. two years of... 40 uh, months, yeah. Yeah, that's, of, of strike. That's three and a half years, yeah. Of strike, yeah. affecting the education system in this country. Yeah. So my question is basically, how are we going to handle this? So it doesn't continue to um, derail the standard of education. They, unfortunately, there's not a lot the citizenry can do. It's the government. Because, and I say that because I'm not one to blame the government for everything. I think we, where we need to take responsibility, we should. But in this case, the reality is that as long as prior education being a priority is only lip service to in, for most administrations in this country, then we're, we're not going to move from here. Because ASU's demands are not unreasonable, in my opinion. But I've seen some of what they, what they are demanding for. It's not unreasonable when you look at the general standard of universities across, not even across the world, but across Africa. So it's not, again, when I say it's not unreasonable, yes, there are those demands, but how do those demands get implemented? It has to be in partnership with the government, or they have to have some sort of um, agreement, which they've had, but for some reason, it's never been implemented. And every time they have this conversation, ASU is going on a two-week warning strike. Yeah, same way I bet they, you, they will I come bet back you. and have um, even a further one if government does nothing. Yeah, but that's the problem. I bet you, and see, th these things happen because many people in government don't have a personal stake in this. Many of their kids don't study in Nigerian univers universities. I'm, sure, I'm reasonably certain of that. Because when you have, um, when you have students in universities whose education be keeps being constantly disrupted by these strikes, you have people who, who, who spend six years on four-year courses because of these strikes. So if the decision makers have their stake in that and they know that it's going to take their children six years to study a four-year course, I suspect they'll move a little bit quicker to so get what, this what, you, you, you said the citizenry cannot do it. What about our National Assembly? Can't they maybe, as a solution, enact a law that mandates <clears throat> as a step towards that mm. officers that are serving the government not to send their children abroad to school? Well, <laughs> they can enact the law, but it's not, again, I think it would be an illegal law because you can't really stop anyone as long as a person can afford it. So what's you the can't way, really stop what's anyone from sending their child where they want. Do you see a way out? Because at the end of the day, we keep talking about the young people being yeah, the but future. That's, no, but that's what I'm saying. The, the only way out here is for the government to take education as seriously as they say they take it. That's, they, they don't seem to be taking so well, it. Well, so instead of, instead of, are, are we going to stay this way? I, and keep going on strike after strike. Yeah, we've been doing it for more than 20, almost 20 years. And the reality is, I don't see it changing. And the only way, see, let's, let's, be, let's be brutally honest. The only way this is going to change is if government takes education seriously. Right now, they don't. That's the truth of the matter. Because if you look at, I went to a federal government secondary school in Jos. And when I, I saw pictures, so we're on a WhatsApp group with some of my friends, I saw pictures, I've seen pictures rather over the last few months of what the school looks like today. And I could not believe that was the school I went to. If it's, it's so run down. And this is despite the fact that the old students' associations have done certain things there, but it still looks a mess. And I say that because when I was there, that wasn't what it looked like. So, and you, so if you multiply this by the number of um, federal government colleges across the country, and then take that same, take the same thing ac across universities in the country, it's not, it's not a pretty so picture. So, talking of leadership now, mm. for, in, 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 among the crop of leaders that we have, especially yep. those that are putting <coughs> themselves forward to serve, mm. do you see anyone? Because before you blink, the next three years is over, and we're talking yep. about elections again. Um, do you see any likely candidates that could? place education in a position of priority? Because as it seems now, we're just like, you know, rudderless. Well, if I, I can't point to anyone, but what I would say is to do that, we need to look at, so if someone says he's running for president, for example, he's a former, let's say he's a former governor, former senator, I think what we then need to do is look at what that person has done in the education space, either in their state, um, what bills have they sponsored to improve um, education at the national level, those sorts of things. If 
these are people that haven't done any of those things. They are not going to suddenly get to Axel Rock and then decide to prioritize education. It won't happen. Um, so as long as we have people who, um, who, who see education as a priority, which it should be, I, for the life of me, I can't understand why it's not. Um, then again, we're just going to keep running around in circles, unfortunately. I hope we get those leaders. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts so far. You. All right, to take a quick break, and when we return, we'll be talking about Masab, advising residents of the southern region of Nigeria on self-defense. Stay with us. <laughs> 